Greetings and salutations! Welcome to a video about audio. Today we're going to be talking about one of the Audio-Technica VM series cartridges. It is the Audio-Technica VM510CB. This cartridge has no love from the community. I could not find any reviews on YouTube or even online. Nobody has said nice things about it, which is very sad. I have nice things to say about it. That's what we're going to do in this video. This is a low pro screencast. There's not going to be much to look at on the screen, so if you want to go do something else and just listen to the video, I promise you won't miss much. Later on, I'll have some graphics when I'm talking about stylus shapes, but for the front part of the video, I just want to talk about this phono cartridge and how it performed. So if you're here for a quick review, you know, hang around till you get what you need and then you can bail and later on I will get into more in-depth things talking about stylus shape and why I wanted to have this particular cartridge for my collection of 45s. So back over to the Audio-Technica website here. The VM series of cartridges was introduced in 2018. They have the VM95 series, which is a quote-unquote lower end bunch of cartridges based loosely on the Audio-Technica 95E, the venerable cartridge of old. I've done many videos on those cartridges. Still a fan, very nice. This is the higher end crowd. These cartridges are backwardly compatible with things like the AT440 MLA, the AT120E, and the MLX uh, from, from way back. If you remember those and you have one of those cartridges, the styli that are meant to go in these cartridges will work in the older ones. Thank you, Audio-Technica, for being backwardly compatible. That is awesome. But apparently they've all gotten a big revamp inside with the introduction of the VM series, and I've had a few of these so far and have been very impressed with the sound. They are not perfect. They have their challenges, and we'll talk about that as we roll along. But first, let's talk about this particular cartridge. Uh, this is the entry level into this line of cartridges, and it's available for about $119. It features a bonded conical stylus. We'll talk more about what that is later on. Then we have the elliptical bonded. This is the 520 EB. Would not recommend this cartridge at all. All Audio-Technica elliptical bonded styli are horrible, and they have been for years. I don't know why, but they sound terrible. I've never come across one that I like the sound of. Uh, the tip mass is too heavy. They don't track well. They have lots of sibilance, and sometimes they even have very noticeable distortion, so I stay away from them. Moving on up the chain, we have the VM530EN. Now this features a nude elliptical stylus. Same stylus shape, but this is a different construction. A nude stylus is a solid diamond, whereas a bonded stylus is just a chip of diamond that is cemented to the end of a shank that's at the end of the cantilever. Cheaper to construct. And you have to be very careful with bonded styli, not only for the tip mass, but making sure that the tip is aligned. And there's, there's several different things that can happen there to cause problems, even though it's cheaper for the manufacturer to make because it's less diamond. So as we move on up the food chain here, we have uh, another cartridge. Uh, we have the 540ML. This is the microline stylus shape. Now we are getting into exotic shaped styli. These cartridges are intended for playing LPs in good condition. They are not necessarily good for playing yard sale find records, 45s, old mono LPs, stuff like that. We'll talk about why that is later on in the video. Going on up the food chain here, you'll see that the next one is the VM610 Mono. This is an interesting cartridge. It's basically the 510 but wired up in mono so you do not get any stereo separation when you wire this up if you have a lot of mono records from the 40s 50s and 60s this is a beneficial cartridge to you you may want to set this up uh, you could put it on another head shell and swap it out with a stereo or you could have a turntable that was just dedicated for playing your mono lps if that's what you're into collecting and some people are 
We also have the SP here, which is a cartridge that is designed to play 78 RPM records, and I believe this stylus is also compatible with 16-inch radio transcription discs, V-discs, things like that. I'm talking about the older, larger, grooved records before the introduction of the LP. And then we get into the jewelry in the line. This is the 740 ML, which is exactly the same as a 540 ML spec wise. It uses the same stylus. It has the same insides. The difference is this has an aluminum body. And for that aluminum body, you're going to pay, uh, what is it, 75 extra dollars? It's jewelry. And then we have uh, uh, more twists on that. We've got the uh, 750 SH with a Shibata stylus, and that is an even $449. And then we have the cream of the crop of the magnetic cartridges for the Audio Technica line. It is the VM760 SLC, Super Line Contact, which is, I guess, a, a new style of shape that they have. And that cartridge will cost you a whopping $649 which puts it out of my price range. I don't know about you. There was one YouTuber who casually mentioned that he would never buy a phono cartridge that cost more than its weight in gold. That's getting there, right there. But I am not completely above the idea of having a nice piece of jewelry at the end of my tone arm, and one of my future goals, I think, is to save up enough money to buy a 740 ml right here and then change that out with the 510 cb conical stylus and use it to play 45s watch me i'll do it <laughs> that's way down the road though so let's get back to talking about the subject i just wanted to give you guys a quick tour and let you know what the the siblings uh in the line are all about here we'll take a look at the specifications i have been uh using these cartridges off and on now for many years. I had a 530EN, which I really liked, and then I have been using the uh, 740ML. No, the, I wish I was using a 740ML. It was a 540ML. Thank you very much. And I've been loving that cartridge. Uh, they go into here, they talk about the construction. I want to take a look at the specifications. The first thing here that you'll notice is that they are uh, boasting a stereo separation is it in here or do I have to click more probably have to click more where is stereo separation it's 25 DB vertical tracking angle that does a lot of people a lot of good okay channel separation 25 DB they mean it this cartridge has lovely stereo imaging it is very accurate it's not overblown and it's very nice indeed. I was shocked by how well this cartridge worked with stereo because I have gotten used to the super wide stereo image that uh, I'm getting from the 540ML. And that's one of the reasons I bought one of these for my other turntable is I didn't want it to be a huge step down in quality when I started listening to records with this cartridge. And uh, the main reason that I bought this cartridge, by the way, is to get a conical stylus tracking under 2 grams uh, to play back uh, styrene 45s and mono LPs. I'll talk more about that later on. So, uh, yeah, this is all pretty much standard, but here's one of the things about these cartridges that you have to be aware of. Recommended load capacitance, right here. They have this listed as 100 to 200 picofarads. Now, for those of you who are not electronics wizards and don't understand what that means, capacitance is when the cabling from the cartridge to the preamp itself acts like a capacitor. You can't avoid that. That happens with pretty much every electronic component. And Audio-Technica here has an unrealistic number because the cables themselves will be higher than 200 picofarads capacitance. And that can cause an issue with this particular kind of cartridge in that you will get a very harsh, very bright, high frequency response because it will it'll sort of build up the high frequencies. And at first I was having a problem with that myself. And then I stumbled upon a solution for my setup with my um, 
Fluence turntable, and that is to get me some Project Connected. Uh, these are the Connected E cables, and these are what Project calls semi balanced, which means that if I can get this to zoom in, you'll see that uh, essentially you connect the shields only at one end. Well, another thing about these cables are that they are tuned for length, they are a specific length which reduces capacitance in the cable and reduces standing waves in the cable as well and when I put this on my Fluence turntable and then hooked it into my Sony amplifier which has a very nice even if basic uh, phono preamp in it, it flattened out the frequency response very nicely. This might be something that could help you. These aren't cheap though, these are about $69 uh, my advice would be to kind of, if you're getting very bright sound out of these, to swap cables, use the shortest cables you can get, or get a pair of tuned cables like this. Now, I'm not one of those people that will tell you that if you spend $600 for speaker cables, your speakers are going to sound better, because I think when you're dealing with high-level stuff, like line level and high level speaker drives and things like that I don't think the cables matter that much especially at home because we're using such short lengths of cable um, and do keep in mind I worked in radio stations and recording studios all of my adult life and the cable that they used in those places was atrocious compared to what you'll find most audiophiles using even if they buy basic stuff uh, just keep that in mind um, however when you're dealing with interconnecting turntables, low-level phono cartridges, especially moving coil, moving mag, doesn't matter. The cables matter. They will change the sound, the length of the cable, the capacitance of the cable. It all contributes, so you might have to play with this. Another thing that you could do would be just to get a, a, a preamp that you can adjust, one that you can tailor the... Uh, the capacitance uh, and the resistance to get the flat frequency response you're looking for. And they are out there. Uh, I had a friend of mine who picked up one that had little tubes in it, a little tube preamp, and had beautiful switches on the front. You could take your cartridge and you could flatten that thing out and tailor it. It was beautiful. So that might be something you want to do. I found this worked for me. All right, back to the main feature here. Uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same. You know, we, we expect these. Uh, when I put this on my dual turntable, it's a dual CS618, which is a new turntable from dual, uh, I didn't have any problem with capacitance at all because I'm using the internal preamp in the dual. There are no cables. It comes out of the tone arm, it goes across over to a circuit board where the internal preamp is, and the turntable itself puts out line level. It's one of the reasons I bought that turntable was because it had a really good preamp built in. And I thought, okay, this is really cool. I won't have to fuss with cables and whatnot. Um, I do have to do that with my Fluence, but like I said, I solved the problem. Yes, these cartridges are bright. Yes, they do have a lot of high end. These are not, quote unquote, warm in any way, shape, or form. I've commented on that before in my videos here about people who go on about the warm sound of analog records. No. Uh, that warm sound you're hearing is the fact that the cartridge can't cope with the high frequencies because it's a piece of junk. Records are quite capable of being extremely bright, even more than CD is in some ways. And so uh, this idea that you're listening to records for some warm and fuzzy sound is, is ridiculous to me. Uh, engineers, as a matter of fact, in the 70s and 80s were trying to push that high end as much as possible, especially starting in the early 80s. That's when records came along that were very bright. You might remember that uh, things like Christopher Cross's first album had a lot of high frequencies on it. That was the new sound. They were moving in that direction. Mid-70s, you know, the 60s was very harsh. A lot of mids, if you listen to a lot of that music, they, the way it was originally mixed back then, it was a lot of mids, try to make it sound good on AM radio. And then in the 70s, we went the other direction. In the mid-70s, everything had lots of bass and balls, and it was dead, and there was no reverb in it, and they didn't really care about the high end too much. And then as you get to the late 70s, things start to brighten up, and by the early 80s, they get very bright. And by the late 80s, they are excessively bright with lots of reverb and whatever. And then in the 90s, it went back down the other direction. All of that was intended to be on records. 
So, you know, it's as far as that goes. This cartridge displayed a level of finesse that I was not prepared for, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this video. The cartridge itself uh, just plays, it sings. That's a, I have a friend of mine that has one of these, and that's how he describes it. It sings. I started out playing 45s. I started out playing yard sale records on it. I started out goofing around, and then I used it to transfer a bunch of stuff over for the radio station that I work for. And I was super impressed at the quality, the airy high end. And even though it is a conical stylus, there's a lot of detail here. There's a lot of finesse in the sound. It is perfect, perfectly listenable. And then I started playing LPs on it. I started playing the stuff that I would ordinarily reserve for the 540ML these days. I was really impressed with the sound. Now, the 540ML being a different kind of stylus, different kind of shape, it does impart a little bit more Christmas crispness, a little bit more detail. It's there. But if you're just starting out and you want to taste of what high-end moving magnet cartridges sound like. You want a taste of it. And you're looking to upgrade. Let's say that you bought something that had a 2M red on it, or it has, like, uh, maybe you've got one of the um, Fluence RT turntables that came with a 91B or the uh, AT VM 95 uh, cartridge, the 95E, the one with the bonded stylus that they have. That if, if you want to just step up and taste what the next level is like, this is a good way to go. It's a very good cartridge. And like I said in the beginning of the video, it gets no love. So, why did I want this cartridge? What is my plan? Well, here's my plan. I wanted this cartridge for playing back 45s, mono LPs, yard sale records. You're going to get... Number one, I think you get a cleaner sound from a damaged record with a conical stylus than you do with any elliptical stylus, just simply because um, the detail is already ripped off the record, and so you're not worrying about that. Plus, these particular styli from Audio-Technica, Audio-Technica's uh, conical styli are 0.6 mil. They track lower, and... So a lot of records that you will buy at yard sales, or in England you call them a boot sale, you know what I mean, a used record. You know, you take them home, you clean them up, and you find out that they have been kind of abused on old turntables with ceramic cartridges. Those had 0.7 mil styli. So the 0.6 mil is just slightly smaller and tracks a little bit lower in the groove. Uh, it is also recommended that if you collect 45s that the cartridges you use to play them should have a conical stylus on it and my preference is to have something that tracks at two grams or below i don't think going up to three grams causes a great deal of extra damage to the record but just to err on the side of safety and i have been collecting 45s like a madman lately i have so many that now i'm past the point of no return and now i'm thinking about how i can keep them playable and still enjoy them you know what i mean now those of you who have been following this channel will know that since i bought this dual turntable that i have had a cavalcade of cartridges on it i started out with the ortofon 2m blue which is a nude 0.3 by 0.7 elliptical. And then I moved on to a Stanton 680 EL, which is a professional cartridge with a 0.4 by 0.7 elliptical that tracks at 3 grams. I used that for a while. And then I've, I've had all kinds of things on here. I put a Shure cartridge on here that I got from old Radio Shack Shure cartridge. You may remember that video. I also uh, had an Audio Technica. AT91B, which is an old um, cartridge based on the 3600 style body. And that is a conical stylus with a carbon fiber cantilever, and it tracks at 2 grams. And that's pretty decent sounding cartridge, except it doesn't have much on the high end. It's uh, It also just doesn't have the finesse that I was getting from the other cartridges. So while it worked and it, it accomplished my goal, it wasn't good enough for what I was 
wanting to do. As a matter of fact, that project that I mentioned where I was transferring stuff, I started doing it with that cartridge. I got about halfway through it, and I went, this just sounds like crap. I said, I, just, I can't put this on the air. I'm not going to do this. Um, and so I actually put this cartridge back on the turntable. When I first bought this cartridge, and I bought this just before Christmas, I had a very bad experience with it, and it's not the cartridge's fault. It was my fault. I put it on the turntable, and I set it up, and when I played it back, I didn't like the sound at all. The right channel was way too hot. We're not talking about a dB or too hot. This was like 4 or 5 dB, and I was getting all this weird sound, and it didn't sound right. It turned out to be a bad connection. But I had taken the cartridge off, and then I put the 91 B on, and I was playing that for a while. When I put it back on is when I discovered that I had a bad connection. Actually, it was a piece of fuzz on one of the plugs on the head shell, and I got it that off of there, and the problem went away. This cartridge is slightly hot on the right channel, but not by enough to be a big deal. And that's kind of an Audio Technica thing anyway. They They all... It's because they use dual magnets and dual coils in them. They tend to um, sometimes can have a little bit of a balance issue, and that might go away with a new stylus because the flux of the magnets might be different. But it is not anything to write home about, and, and certainly for casual listening, not a big deal at all. And when I was doing my transfers, it was just a matter of tweaking the left channel up a little bit. and It was perfectly balanced after that and uh, the recordings that I got were unbelievably good and I put them on the air on the radio station so uh, with styrene 45s in particular I wanted to touch on this if you want to collect 45s you, your stylus shape is very important uh, you need to be using either a conical or a very mild elliptical tracking lightly and I kind of found out that even the um, Ortofon 2M Blue was a little bit too aggressive for styrene 45s. It's one of the reasons I, I got rid of that cartridge. I took it off the turntable. I have never been able to really cozy up to Ortofone cartridges. I just can't. They, they're they a little rough around the edges. Every one that I've ever heard. And uh, I end up passing them down the line. But anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about stylus shape. I, I pretty much do this in every one of these videos just to kind of put this out there so people understand. And this is a graphic uh, that's kind of old from Audio-Technica. So you start out with the conical stylus. And conical means it's a ball. This is the original specification for playing back every kind of record there's ever been. And in cartridges, records, and whatnot, we, we like to throw our weights and measures around and mix between imperial and metric. So when I'm saying mil, I'm not talking about millimeters. I'm talking about mils as in one one thousandth of an inch. The original specification was that when you would play a micro groove record, we're talking about 1948 with the introduction of the LP by Columbia, and then in 1949 when RCA came out with the 45, both of them had the same specification that they should be played with a 0.1 mil stylus. When stereo was introduced in the late 50s, it was recommended that you use a 0.7 mil stylus. This is slightly smaller, tracks a little lower in the groove. It is compatible with the older mono micro grooves, but with stereo, the way the, gro the, rec the groove is cut, that stylus can not only move side to side, but it could also move up and down and sideways and all kinds of stuff. So the thought was is that if you reduce the stylus tip, first of all, you're going to get a uh, tip size. You're going to get a little bit more detail, and it will be less apt to bounce out of the groove. Because in a stereo cartridge, you have to have compliance not only side to side, but up and down. The old mono cartridges from the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s, they didn't have any up and down compliance at all. That's why you shouldn't play a stereo record with one of those old mono cartridges because they're not designed to deal with that. And they usually tracked very heavy in those days. If it was ceramic, it could be anywhere between uh, 4 and 8 grams. And the slightest bit of stylus wear would just eat records. So playing back a, a record with a 0.6 mil stylus will track below a lot of that damage and uh, you may be able to hear things that were ordinarily you couldn't from the record. 
45s, uh, the ones that are made out of polystyrene, which was a common material for U.S. 45s in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they need to have special care because they uh, just do not do well with more advanced stylus shapes. And we're talking about even the, or, like I said, the Ortophone 2M Red. Uh, I noticed that when I would put the stylus down on the record before it went down into the groove, when it was just tracking on the surface, was digging a nice little trench. I was like, okay, it's a little too sharp. And uh, the Microline styli and the um, Shibata styli, which are on up the food chain, they have very specific shapes. They are shaped in such a way to mimic the cutting head itself. The cutting head is shaped like a little shovel. It's made out of sapphire. It is heated. It goes down into the lacquer, and it scoops it out while it is uh, also putting the audio vibrations in there that are being fed to it the audio signal this thing's moving all around and it's digging that out so the idea behind uh, an exotic stylus shape is to get as close to that original shape as possible and to have more contact with the groove walls and the thing about that is is that it assumes that the grooves are perfectly shaped they're not worn and uh, with styrene having those very sharp styli can cause uh, basically the the stylus to cut a new groove in the record and especially if the the turntable is not perfectly aligned and the, it's everything's got to be dead on it's just not a good idea and i had uh, one person i had talked about this in a video past and came along and said well it doesn't make any sense because if you're dealing with line contact and uh elliptical styli they have more contact with the groove they're spreading the pressure of the tracking force over a larger area wouldn't that be better regardless of the material well it's true with vinyl it's not true with styrene you see the difference between vinyl and styrene is vinyl is flexible styrene is not and vinyl will kind of move out of the way it'll kind of flex a little bit whereas and then it'll bounce back to where it was it, it with styrene on the other hand once you push it past the point where now you are breaking it down for whatever reason it never comes back and that's why styrene records that have a lot of wear have a that lovely hashy uh, run through sound that you hear on like old jukebox records that have been played thousands and thousands of times so i go with the conventional wisdom that the conical stylus is best also let's talk about the difference between a nude stylus and a bonded stylus a a nude stylus is one where they have a diamond which is cut to a particular shape which is cemented directly to the cantilever the cantilever is the needle itself that you see coming down toward the record the stylus is affixed to the end of that cantilever at a right angle to track the record in a bonded stylus you'll have a chip of diamond and then you'll have that bonded to a metal shank, which is then bonded to the cantilever. And the cement itself that they use adds a lot of mass to the tip of the stylus, making it harder to track. The more, uh, the more mass the tip has, the more likely it is to lose contact with the groove wall because it's, you're slinging this thing back and forth at super high speeds, and that will cause things like sibilance distortion and all kinds of problems, which is one of the reasons I hate bonded elliptical styli, because then you add in the fact that the stylus tip itself, because it is not a ball, it is an elliptical stylus is shaped like an American football, and what it'll do is... Uh, the idea is, is that you take the edges of that football, the pointy sides, and you put that to the walls of the groove. And then when you have very high modulation on the record, uh, as the stylus goes around the corners, it's like, you know, imagine like, a, you know, like, what is it, luge? <laughs> and they're going down these sleds and they have these different courses. It's doing exactly the same thing. The idea behind having that stylus that's wider than it is long is that as it goes around these corners there's less of a chance for it to get pinched and ride up and cause more distortion and lose detail and all that other crap um, i find with a 0.6 mil stylus that it usually tracks a lot better than any bonded elliptical out there i've ever heard and this cartridge proves it once again it's absolutely true it's the same thing 
So there's my little uh, primer on stylus shape. And yes, it should be logically that a microline stylus or a line contact or a Shibata or a Vanden Hall or any of those should be better for playing even polystyrene 45s, but it's not. In reality, it causes all kinds of issues. So if you have polystyrene, I recommend conical or very mild elliptical. Um, the Audio-Technica nude elliptical styli are, are pretty... Uh, they're okay with styrene. I haven't had a problem. I've played that. I've played a lot of styrene records with uh, the Audio-Technica VM95EN and the VM530EN from the series of cartridges we're looking at today with no major problems. So there you go. It's your little tutorial about stylus shape. And now that I have everything set up the way I want it, the idea here now is to try and stop buying so many phono cartridges. Kind of uh, just get to know the systems that I have set up here. I've been frantically trying all kinds of different things for a long time. And this year I want to take the money that I would ordinarily be putting into buying cartridges and speakers and things like that and put it into buying more records and CDs and things. And uh, maybe even saving up for something really super cool like a you know, a 740 ML cartridge that I'll put a 510 CB stylus on. <laughs> I might do it, man, I'm telling you. So, yeah, I, I have pretty much gone this direction. I, I do love the old Shures and, this, and the Stantons. I don't think that they make anything that sounds as good as those cartridges these days. If, you've, if you're an old dog like me and you've been around, man, the Stantons and the Shures from the... Uh, 70s and 80s and 90s were just amazing. Sure doesn't make phono cartridges anymore. They don't make replacement styli. They're almost impossible to find. And Stanton has been almost completely out of business for so long. And their stuff is difficult to find. There's a lot of aftermarket garbage on the internet that you can buy and then get it and it doesn't sound good. And I have been trying to find styli for my Shure and Stanton cartridges and with no luck and the stuff that I have bought has been just a bust it doesn't sound as good and I end up going back to the original and then hoping an original will pop up that isn't all dried out and it's forget it we're gonna we're gonna go with Audio Technica because they are doing an outstanding job of supporting their product line and even going back to stuff that they were putting out 10 15 20 years ago so thank you for that, and I think that should be applauded. The only uh, cartridge manufacturer that I'm curious about these days is Grado. And for those of you who would watch this entire video, I would love to get your opinion on Grado phono cartridges. Because at some point I would like to pick up maybe an Opus, which is their wooden bodied uh, cartridge. It's a high output moving coil. Uh, I'd like to have one of those. Maybe. I'd like your opinion on that. If that's something that you know about, put it in the comments below. Thank you for watching. I certainly do appreciate it. And if you end up picking up one of these cartridges, uh, please tell me how it goes. Put it in the comments below. Let me know what your experience is with it. I was just really impressed, especially with the finesse, the stereo imaging. What a wonderful little cartridge for not a whole lot of money. $119 in the U.S. That's very affordable. That's pizza out one night, guys. That's a night out at a nice restaurant. And uh, the uh, styli for this, the 510CB, they last about 500 hours before they need to be replaced. Audio Technica says that the ML styli, even though they are way more expensive, uh, last longer at 1,000 hours. So I figure I'm getting ahead here because their uh, elliptical styli, they're only rated for 300 hours. That's their numbers. And so looking at the fact that the uh, the 510 CB stylus is relatively cheap I can burn those up and replace them twice a year I got no problem with that 500 hours would be a record a day for about two years and a thousand hours of course would be like a record a day for then you're talking about four years It'd take a long time to wear out an ML stylus so yes they're more expensive up front the ML but it's uh, if they last as long as they say they do then it's actually quite economic Anyway, that's all I got for today. Thank you for watching the video. We will talk again soon.